Welcome to John Gets Games. This is another good games vlog where I'll be discussing my initial impressions on some new games that I was able to play recently that I enjoyed. I will be going through them in alphabetical order as you can see. Now I do want to point out that if you'd prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please Please go to jongetsgames.com slash support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with great bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's now start talking about these games, and the first of them is Bytes. Now, technically, I played all four of these games in the same evening uh, with essentially the same people, and um, the other three games that I'll be discussing are train theme related. However, Bytes is all about ants at a picnic. Now, this one was sold to me uh, by these people as a stealth train game, and I'll talk about why in a second, but uh, mechanically what you're doing in this game is you are putting out a long trail of these different colored tokens. Uh, you can kind of uh, uh, squirrel around the board if you want, to, and then at the very end, you will have ants in five different colors. Now, when it's your turn, you're just going to move one of the ants forward on that track until it reaches the next token that matches that color. So if I want to move the yellow ant, I will move it up until it reaches the first yellow token, which is cheese. You must stop at that token, but then you have the option of taking a token from the track either before or after the spot where that ant landed. So you can't choose where the ant lands, but you will have a couple of options potentially. Also, you can move any of the ants that are still at the end of the line. Um, they are not associated with any one player or anything like that. So you have a decent amount of options for what kind of tokens you want. And this is important because the game is going to go until all of the ants have reached the very end of the line and they kind of form up onto this ant hill. And then once the game is over, everyone will get points equal to the tokens that they have in front of them multiplied by the modifier where the ant is. So that means if I took three of the red apple tokens and the red ant landed on the two spot on the ant hill at the very end of the game, then each of my apples are worth two points and those are worth six points total. Uh, so you want to have the most points in order to win. And this is where the stealth train game part comes into play because these tokens that you're taking, which is like cheese or bell peppers or apples, are almost like stocks because you want them to do well and you're constantly paying attention to what your opponents are taking because if a lot of people are going really big on certain tokens, then they are more incentivized to try and move that ant quicker, farther down the track to get it to the ant hill. Now, I say quicker, and this is a really important distinction because technically Bytes is a re-implementation of a game called Big Points, which came out in 2008. Now, the rules that I've taught you there is essentially the rules to Big Points, but Bytes brings in some extra things that change each game. Now, I said that the first ant to reach the end goes to the top of the ant hill. Well, that's the way it was in my one play of the game, but in the future, it might not be like that. You actually shuffle up these decks of cards, and one of them dictates how the ants go up onto that hill. So maybe next time I play, the first ant to get to the hill will actually go to the bottom and make all of those tokens worth nothing, and that will definitely uh, change the overall uh, feel of that play as people are trying to move those ants. Like, if you have a bunch of red apples, then you want to stall that red ant, ant out as much as possible. If the last ant to go onto that hill goes onto the high highest modifier spot. Um, now, I've only played this game once, and it was first come, uh, goes to the top in that one play. But another thing that the game has are these chocolate tokens shuffled in with the rest of them. Now, these don't give you points per se, but every time you play the game, you will draw a random card, which will tell you what the action is for those chocolate uh, tokens. So when you take those, you can then spend them to do something, and it will be potentially different each time you play. In this specific play, it let us um, take the three tokens from the very end of the line, choose one, and put them up to the front of the line, which means you can actually affect the line and give you more choices for the tokens that you wanted. Um, and there are a bunch of other options that I didn't even look into. Uh, in addition to that, there's also a special rule modifier card that you can shuffle up that separate deck and then reveal it, and it will change how things work. It might swap out one of the ants with like a special ant or change other things entirely to uh, stop certain things from scoring at all. And that will definitely vary how the game plays from one play to the next. Now, I've only played this game once, but I have to admit that I was very impressed by it. Uh, I played it on Tabletop Simulator. I played all of these games on Tabletop Simulator, actually. 
And uh, the simplicity of the rule set uh, worked really well. Um, you just move any ant and then take a token on either side. But the um, ramifications of those decisions were really interesting. Trying to pay attention to what everybody else had, as well as trying to make sure that you were not setting someone up for a really good play. For example, if the yellow ant has made it to the end and in this play, it went to the top for the highest modifier, then you probably don't want to move another ant to make it easy for somebody else to grab another yellow token. So you might want to try and avoid that happening. But maybe you do that anyway because you still get a good advantage from that and you have to consider that uh, for that play. So I'm actually looking forward to playing this one more uh, just to see the uh, variety of different actions for the chocolate pieces, as well as for how the ants hit the end. I didn't even mention it, but another piece uh, scores differently each time you play the game. It doesn't score based off of the ants. Um, in this one play, it was uh, worth one point for every one of that token that you had. So if you had three of them, then they were all worth three points each. And if you had one, then that's just worth one. So that is another way that this game will play very differently from one game to the next, at least as far as the group think and the uh, atmosphere of the game, because mechanically, you're still just moving one ant, taking one token, then your turn passes over to the next person. Uh, so yeah, I was impressed by the rules of it. I was impressed by the fun that we had overall. It doesn't hurt that I tied for victory. I didn't win, and there's no tiebreaker in this game, but I'll still take it. <laughs> uh, and I just think that this is a great system for a variety of different experiences. And the uh, real version, you know, the kind that you put on your table, uh, looks gorgeous. The tokens are rather large and they're double layered with bites taken out of them. Um, honestly, right after playing this game once, I started uh, looking up on Board Game Geek to see how I might be able to get a copy for myself. I'm not convinced I want a copy, but I'm definitely tempted at this point. Uh, this one ran on Kickstarter last year, and uh, or I guess in uh, 2019, because it's now 2021, uh, and it released last year in 2020. Uh, so yeah, um, a big thumbs up for my initial experience with Bytes. Um, overall, this four-player game took maybe 30 minutes to play. So the fact that we had some uh, fun, crunchy decisions, lots of ramifications from the things that we were doing in a relatively small time frame and a very quick teach overall is yet another uh, positive uh, aspect to this game. So uh, I'm hoping to play this one more. All right, the next game I'll be discussing is Chicago Express. Now, this is a cube rails game. In fact, um, this, uh, for many people, seems to be like the go-to classic cube rails game. Uh, I've been playing a bunch of cube rails games um, over the last couple of months. This is the third good games vlog in a row, I think, that I'm talking about them. And uh, in all of the previous ones, people would comment saying, you got to try Chicago Express. So I now have. And um, at its heart, mechanically, it feels a lot like many of the other ones. So you have a hexagon grid in the middle of the table on a board. And um, in this game, you're going to be buying shares of stock in the, I can't remember exactly, the, the, the several companies that come in the game. I think it's four plus uh, another fifth one that can happen later on. Um, and then when you're actually taking your turns, you are going to be either adding track down onto the board, or you're going to be starting an auction for another share of stock, which you might win by spending your money or somebody else might take it. Uh, or you can develop a spot on the board, which makes it better for every railroad company that already has a uh, token down on there. Um, now, I know I'm glossing over a lot of basics to cube rails. I'm going to try not to go through the basics every time I talk about these. But um, in this game, the railroads are not tied to the players. You're just getting shares in these different railroads and you want them to do well based off of, you know, how many shares you actually have in them. Now, as you are placing these uh, um, tokens out onto the board, as you're essentially laying track for these companies, you are spending the treasury, the money from the treasury of those companies, and you can put more money into those companies by buying more stocks. So that's definitely a key thing to keep in mind. And in this one play, I've only played it once, but in this one play, uh, early on in the game, I invested a couple of times in the blue company and nobody else did. And then because of player order and whatnot, the red company, uh, train company, came through and blocked blue off in a pretty big way. Um, many of the spots on the board can only have one train on them, and red really uh, cut off the main avenue that I was hoping to do. Um, I remember in that moment, some people were like, well, blue is potentially dead for this game, but... I had hope. <laughs> well, actually more like I had sunk cost fallacy because I had already invested in this company a couple of times. So I was going to make blue work. And because of that, I kind of redirected my effort and went around this mountain range. And blue ended up being a very lucrative company, which was a very cool thing to see. That's a big thing that I enjoy seeing in these cube rails games is because um, things aren't always a foregone conclusion. Sometimes you can make things work. And by 
doubling down on that company, other people decided that maybe it was actually worth investing in it. So they would buy stock and now multiple people are helping that company out. In fact, um, I was pushing the blue train so much uh, throughout the game that I kind of forgot that it wasn't my company. And near the very end of the game, one of my opponents bought enough stock to equalize me in the stocks, which meant suddenly I... Everything I did for the blue train helped an opponent out equally. Of course, there were several of us around the table, so by doing that, I wasn't helping the other people, but this is just a, a standard thing that you see in these games. Um, now, I've glossed over a thing that really makes uh, Chicago Express cool, and that has to do with the action selection. So I briefly said you are going to be laying track, developing, or you are going to be starting auctions. But the way you do this is there are these dials on the board for each of those, and you move a little token over to the right when you select that specific action. Now, you can only select that action if it can move over to the right. They are dials, so once that specific action has been selected um, enough times, it'll reach the very far right spot, and no one can do that action until the overall round ends. Now, the round ends once two out of those three dials have reached their maximum level. So that means everyone has maxed out on auctions and developing or building and auctions or, you know, all of those different combinations. And at that point, all of the dials reset and everyone gets paid out dividends for the stocks that they have based off of the income level of that train and the railroads increase their income as they lay track out on the board, or at least that's a very simplistic way of saying it. So uh, a big part of this game is looking at those dials and trying to work them to your best advantage. Uh, maybe you actually do an action that's not amazing for you, but just to stop your opponents from actually getting to that action before the next uh, dividend phase happens because you peg it out. And you can also actually just uh, do a null turn where you just move a token on one of the dials and you don't do the action at all, which is something that happened at least once in our game. I think I did it once. Uh, so the way those dials work is really fascinating and it's very elegant. Uh, so I, I definitely appreciated that part of the game. Uh, now, this game is called Chicago Express. And because of that, Chicago is on the map. And another big part of this game is the idea that when a train reaches Chicago going from the uh, east all the way to the west, that company gets an immediate bonus dividend payout. And the first time this happens, the fifth railroad, which is the Wabash Cannonball Railroad, um, become uh, comes into play. Um, you have an auction right there in the middle of the game. Somebody takes one of the two stocks and now that train company can also be run. And it's very close to Chicago. So you can try to get it over to Chicago, which is a very lucrative spot to go to. Now, that's something that can happen, and that's something that probably usually does. But in my one play of Chicago Express, none of the train companies actually reached Chicago, which is honestly pretty fun. <laughs> uh, another thing that I like about these Cube Rails games is you might have an expectation for what's going to happen, but based off of the actions of all the players, sometimes you have some pretty silly things uh, end up happening. Um, in this play, the yellow train company swooped along the bottom of the map and was getting quite close to Chicago. And... Um, when it, it seemed like it was inevitable that yellow was going to reach there, I paid a lot of money for the final yellow stock, I think it was. It was just one yellow stock, but it was better than nothing, I thought, because yellow was going to hit Chicago and have this big payout, and I wanted to be a part of that. Um, now, the tricky thing for this game is, unlike many other games, when the game is over, you don't get any money for your stocks. So I paid, I think, 24 money for that yellow stock, and my um, expectation and hope is that before the game ends, I would make at least 24 more money back from dividend payouts because at the end of the game, I don't get anything for that stock. What I didn't anticipate happening was the fact that because I took that stock, it changed the um, incentive structure for the other players, in particular, the player who had a majority of the yellow stock, and they decided not to go to Chicago. They kind of stalled out a little bit, and then another person laid yellow track in the wrong direction to kind of use up um, enough of it to the point where yellow would never reach Chicago. And I absolutely took a bath on that stock. Uh, I think I probably ended up making maybe 10 to 12 of the 24 money that I spent back. And that hurt because I lost this game by one money. Now, I could sit here and say, well, if I hadn't done that, then clearly I would have won. However, I talked to the player who had a uh, majority stock holding in the yellow company, and they said um, it was either me. I was going to take that stock or they would get it. They had two, and this would have brought them to three. And they said if they had three, then they absolutely would have gone to Chicago, and then everything would have been different. <laughs> like, it's really hard to say uh, what would have happened. And again, that's another thing I love about these Cube Rails games, where it just seems like all these tiny decisions of how much do you bid, one more or one less, and what do you decide to go for, makes these massively divergent realities for the game state uh, where, you know, me deciding to bid 
just that one more to the point where it knocked out the other person meant they couldn't take it. And now Chicago wasn't on the table. None of the trains hit Chicago. The fifth train company never even reached play. And that's just kind of how this game uh, knocked out. Um, now, <laughs> if I had even one more money, I would have tied and that would have been great. And I'm sure I could have done things a little bit better along the way. But overall, I was really impressed with my first play of this. Um, the rules are pretty simple. I know I've been a bit scatterbrained talking about it, but I've been trying to uh, uh, sprinkle in my impressions as I'm talking about the mechanics. And I just think that um, there's a reason why a lot of people call this a classic, and there's a reason why people uh, point to this one as a good, um, I don't know about entry point. It's not a bad entry point, but there are definitely simpler Cube Rails games out there. But this one definitely does a lot of things that I've seen in other Cube Rails games in a very cool way. And it has that dial mechanic, which I haven't seen anywhere else. And I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, so yeah, I'm hoping to play Chicago Express more. I wouldn't say it's my favorite Cube Rails game after playing it just once, but I I am interested to play it more. I'd like to see a game where one of the train companies actually reaches Chicago. I'm sure that's uh, certainly going to vary things up. And it's my understanding that that usually happens. So maybe we were just playing a little bit weird, but you know, that's a thing I like about Cube Rails games. Uh, they can definitely go a bit weird. Uh, so yeah, hoping to play Chicago Express more in the future. At this point, Future John needs to interject into this vlog, because after I recorded all of it, I found out that the next game that I'm talking about, which is Erie Railroad, was taught to me with an accidental rules omission. Uh, this game is all about purchasing and selling stock, and in the next section that you hear, you will only hear me talking about uh, purchasing stock. Uh, the reason for that is because the rule for selling stock was misunderstood by the group that taught it to me, to the point where it didn't even seem worth telling me that selling stock was an option, so the entire next part that I talk about uh, is me from the perspective of somebody not knowing that you could sell stock. Uh, I only found this out because I was poking around Board Game Geek and found that the selling stock action in the game is the most controversial. Uh, it seems like people don't actually like that. So it's possible that because the group that taught this to me misunderstood the rule and decided to never sell things, they stumbled into a better game overall. But uh, either way, realize everything that I'm about to say is effectively a house rule because uh, one whole entire mechanic has been excised from the game. Uh, I don't think I would actually play the game with these selling rules as they are written, so I am okay with it overall, but I did want you to know that before I went in and talked about the game a whole bunch and uh, said quite a few positive things about it because it seems like all of the negative things on Board Game Geek are around selling stock, which again, I didn't even know you could do until after I recorded the vlog. Okay, let's get back to it. Moving on, we now have game number three, which is Erie Railroad. Uh, we actually played this one immediately after we played Chicago Express, and this is, I guess, a cube rails game, even though it doesn't actually have any cubes. And this is not one I had heard, and this is not one that had been recommended to me at all. However, the people who taught me Chicago Express and all the rest of these games um, seemed to quite like it, and they wanted to introduce it to me. Um, now, this is just a card game. You have a uh, deck of cards, and then you have a couple other special cards. And the mechanics of this game are super simple. When it is your turn, you start an auction. That's, that's the whole game, every single turn, starts an auction, and you have a uh, row in the middle of the table where there are two face-up cards. Now, each card has two different symbols on them, and each of those can be uh, associated with one of the five train uh, companies that are in the game. And only one of those cards is actually up for auction. You see the current auction and the next auction, and then once this one is sold, that one slides in, and so you can always see one auction ahead, and then you have a shuffled up deck of cards that you are drawing from. Now, the auction for this is very simple. You just bid a certain amount of money. You have to bid up. If you pass, you can't jump back in. And the person who wins that card has uh, one of two decisions to make. They can either put it in front of them and then uh, orient it so that one of the symbols faces towards them. And that is then going to be a stock in that company for the rest of the game. Uh, the symbol that points away from you is effectively non-existent. The other thing that you can do is take that card you just won at auction and put it into a dividends pile and then pay out dividends for everyone for one of the two companies that shows up on that card. Now, the way the dividends pay out is also very simple. Um, you count up the number of stocks owned for that company and then every stock is worth that much. So that means if there are three red stocks out there, then every red stock is worth three uh, money. And you just put that right into your uh, treasury and then you can spend that on future auctions. So this game has a bit of a tableau building uh, uh, element to it because if you're not putting cards down in front of you as stocks, you're never gonna get money out of uh, dividend payouts, but it also has a really interesting arc. So at the start of the game, 
nobody is paying out for dividends because you don't have stocks. So you're trying to not pay too much for these uh, different stocks. And you also have to be very careful not to be the only one trying to take stocks of a certain type. Uh, the reason for that is because if you have, you know, three red stock in front of you and nobody else has any of it, um, they are obviously not going to be discarding those cards in order to pay a dividend for red because you're the only one who would get any benefit from it. And the problem is that if you just invest in that, you might have spent all your money on those cards, so you don't have enough money to win another auction to make red happen, to then do a dividend to get all of that money. So you have to make sure that you are <laughs> taking enough stocks but not over committing. You want to kind of spread out a little bit so that you get some benefits when other people decide it's in their benefit to do a dividend payout. And all the while you're trying to make sure you don't have a liquidity problem. Uh, now we played a four player game of this and it was um, as strange and wacky as they uh, uh, build it to be. Um, they gave me a lot of advice, which I really appreciate because they've all played this like 10 plus times and it was my first time. So early in the game, I said things like, should I bid on this? And I got some really good advice. So I, I appreciate that they were uh, kind to me in this uh, circumstance. Um, but it, it definitely honed in on the stock buying and holding mentality of these Cube Rails games, where you are essentially cooperating a bit with your competitors, uh, oftentimes trying to streamline behind them, like somebody has two of that stock and you have one. Well, they're probably still going to run dividends for it because they get twice as much as you do, but you still probably get more than other people who have zero. Um, but also, if everyone invests in that company, then maybe people just don't run dividends for it because it's too spread out and it's really not worth it. Uh, certainly not worth spending money because you have to pay money to take the card to then run dividends for it. So you might spend more money that you even than you even make for dividends, or at least that's something that you could do, and you have to really make sure you don't do. Um, now, one thing that can happen in this game, and we did see it in this one play, is you can have a liquidity problem where you overcommit, um, you run down your uh, money total to zero or one or two, a very low amount, and then you're kind of out of the game for a while because you don't have enough money to win any auctions. Um, you're just constantly passing as other people have more money, and you are just sitting there biding your time until somebody does a dividend payout for some stock that you have in front of you. And it's possible that that might never happen for the rest of the game. Uh, this is a quick game. I think it took maybe 30 minutes to play, but you can certainly dig yourself into a hole that you cannot get out of. Um, and uh, they advised me on that to make sure it didn't happen, or at least to, to help make it unlikely for it to happen to me, and it fortunately didn't. But one of my opponents who has played this a bunch did have that happen to them. At least they probably went like, you know, five or six rounds in a row where they couldn't really do anything until they finally were able to squeak out some money from a dividend payout from somebody else, and that got them back into the game. Now, I lost this game. I think I came in third out of four, which is kind of interesting because um, for about a third of the game, I had the most money out of everybody, and I felt like I was in a pretty commanding position. Um, I think it's possible that I was. I just didn't know how to play this game very well to actually capitalize on that. But also, there was a run of cards that just kept having the Erie uh, train company come out, and I was the one who had invested in that more than anybody else. Um, so I had a money advantage, and I was able to spend that money to win auctions to keep running dividends on Erie. But my opponents kind of bled me dry on it. Uh, every time I ran uh, the dividend for Erie, I think I made 12 money, but I was having to spend like eight, nine, or even 10 money to win the auction to run dividends, which means I gained 12, but spent nine. That means I only made three money. And <laughs> one of my other opponents who had a single share was getting for money for that um, uh, for that specific stock. Uh, don't run my math a little bit. I might be screwing this up, but there were definitely points where my opponent netted money on me even though I was winning the auctions and even though I had more stock because I was just maybe bidding too much. Um, so overall, I, I think this was a pretty impressive game as far as the, uh, the settings that it put you into. Um, it's definitely... Um, potentially uh, catastrophic if you play this one wrong, but it's also rather quick, which I appreciate. Um, and I could see how this one would be divisive. Uh, again, I came in third place out of four, and, and I felt like I had a lot of really interesting decisions to make as I was playing the game. I might have a very different opinion if I had done things slightly differently and then had to essentially pass for like eight turns in a row. Uh, and I might not have enjoyed the game as much, but I'm not entirely sure about that because I was definitely warned about that potential scenario uh, right at the start of the game. And I definitely would have made that bed that I would have to get into. Uh, I do think it's possible if that happens to you that you might be just out of the game. Uh, but like so many Cube Rails style games, it's so quick to play that you can just 
do some Hail Marys, uh, do some strange plays and try to see what happens and try to play well while also just exploring the space. And, and I definitely appreciate it for that. The last thing I want to say um, is that um, in general, many times, countless times, I think on this channel over the last seven years, I've said that I don't really like auction games. And at the very beginning of this game, uh, they, they told me, they're like, we're going to play this. We want you to experience this, but it's just auctions. And they, they said they knew that I wasn't a big fan of auctions, but you know, I'm in a position where uh, I'm currently trying to try things that I historically don't necessarily like. And um, I was impressed by how much I enjoyed the auctions that were in this game. And I think a big part of that is because the auctions are very tight and rather small for the most part. Like, you know, somebody bids four and everybody groans and somebody goes crazy and bids five at certain points in the game. Uh, later on in the game, you might bid, you know, even 12 or 13 if it's something you have a lot of stock holdings in. But the bidding amounts are low, and, and that's what I like. It's not one of those games where it's like 55, 56, 57, and you could go up to 100. Um, it's much more granular, which I, I do uh, think endears me more to it as far as an auction game is concerned. Uh, although just in general, I'm having a much smaller problem with auction games as I jump headfirst into all of these cube rails style games. Uh, again, Erie Railroad doesn't actually have any cubes in it, but I definitely saw the familiar concepts in this one uh, to some of the other ones. And just like so many of these cube rails games, it seems like it is honed down almost to just an experimental level, like they've, they've stripped away as many rules as possible, and they have just this, this little gem of a game at the center, which <laughs> is not going to be the nicest game for people in general. It definitely is going to have some crazy group things and possibly degenerate situations where everybody runs out of money and the game just kind of ends because nobody can afford anything. But I think those are also humorous <laughs> and uh, potentially fun as you try to squeak out the win, even in those strange circumstances. And uh, in that respect, I see a lot of promise in Erie Railroad, and I will certainly not say no to playing this one again in the future. Well, we've now reached the fourth and final game I'll be talking about today, and that one is Northern Pacific. Um, now, this is the simplest cube rails game out of all of them that I have experienced so far. In fact, I'm going to try to teach you the rules of the game very, very quickly. Now, you have a map. You're going to go from the east to the west, and there is going to be a single train line that goes along the way, and on your turn, you're either going to place a train down onto the board and you have to extend out that line so there's no forking paths, or you're going to take one of your cubes in front of you and place it down onto a city that isn't already full. It becomes full based off of the player count. Uh, whenever a train touches a city that has player cubes on it, those players pull those cubes back and they gain another cube from the supply for each cube that they pulled back, or they get two from the supply if they have their big cube on that spot. It's like a double investment. Um, once you reach the very western edge of the board, you count up the number of cubes everyone has in front of you. Those are worth points. You count up the cubes on the map, which are bad investments because the train didn't go there, and those are negative points. And then you reset. You do that three times. The person with the most good points wins. Um, that's the game. <laughs> so uh, realistically, this game really is all about the discussions between players and trying to map out what other people are going to be doing because you are going to get paid out for your investment only when the train visits your town. Uh, now, you can only do one action on your turn. So that means if you put a cube down, then other people might just move the train away from that town and you're like, what the heck? I didn't have a chance to actually make that happen, but you probably just misjudged in that circumstance uh, thinking that people would try to go there. Uh, much like many of these cube rails style games, you have um, kind of alliances breaking and uh, being made at all times because if I put my double cube on a city that's a little bit far away from the train and somebody else does, suddenly now both of us really are invested in the train reaching that spot. So as the train gets closer, maybe I put a train token down to veer it in that direction so the next person can kind of like, you know, put the ball through the net and make the train go to that spot so that, you know, it pays out for everybody. Or maybe the circumstance has changed and that person, for other reasons, now thinks it's actually better for the train to avoid that spot that you really want, even though they would have gotten benefit as well. And this game is just all about, um, not necessarily negotiation, but it's all about trying to foresee the future with the relative groupthink and trying to get into people's brains. Um, you're trying to see the trains here. There is, it could go this way, that way, or the other way because the train tracks have um, a directions on them. And you're trying to count things out. You know, I'm going to go, then, you know, blue, then red, then pink. Um, 
blue doesn't care, red wants this, pink wants that. If blue does this, then red does that, then uh, pink does the other thing. And you're trying to map all of these things out, trying to put yourself in a situation where you are very likely to get your investments to pay out. And I found that to be pretty fascinating. Uh, we played this one at, I think it was five players, and the game plays up to six players. Uh, so that means you do one thing, and then four things happen before it's your next turn. So that feels somewhat chaotic, and it feels like you aren't necessarily in control, but you do have your decision to make on your turn. I mean, when you move the train, it's neutral. Um, you want to move it in a direction that helps you out. And in order to do that, you probably want to have cubes on the board. Or if you don't have cubes on the board, then maybe you intentionally move the train in a direction that hurts other people who you think are your competitors. Now, I did say that you essentially do this three times, which means the rules as written essentially mean you play Northern Pacific three times and just count up the points from each one of those plays. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is because um, things can go very strange in this game. So we played one full game, which would be the three, you know, paths all the way through. And the first round, I did okay, and it was relatively slow. The train was kind of meandering around. There were lots of big payouts. And the second round of the game, again, resetting the entire board and going all the way across, there was like two payouts total. And the second round took probably 20% of the amount of time that the first round took for reasons, you know, just group think reasons and, and just discussions and, and, and not, not necessarily the discussions, but also just the reality of the decisions that people made, made this one go really fast. Once it got to the middle of the board, people didn't feel like committing more cubes to the board. So we just kind of ran the train all the way to the end to get through that round and then play again. Um, and that was kind of a good thing because in that second round of the game, I got zero good investments. And I think one or two bad investments. So it was just all bad. So that means if we just played it that one time, then my ending score would have essentially been zero with a negative two multiplier or some or a modifier that is. And um, that wouldn't necessarily be bad because I enjoyed that middle part of the game as well. But I do see why the rules as written say, play it three times and add your scores um, t together as you are trying to like piece together a winning score. Uh, I did come dead last <laughs> in this five player game, but I still really enjoyed it because it was, it was cool to see the emerging thought process that you had uh, from this incredibly simplistic game. Like uh, the simple uh, uh, placement of a cube on one city versus the other can have drastic ramifications on what everybody else decides to do. Uh, you can definitely kind of streamline along with other people uh, to a certain extent, but um, at a certain point, this is a competitive game, so things will probably branch off. And I want to say that you could just get lucky in this game, but but there's no luck. So I, I don't want to say that. Uh, I think it really is about navigating where you think things are going to go in the future. You know, you're not rolling a die, you're not revealing any randomness at all, but sometimes it does feel like you're doing coin flips between one city or the other, and then you just have to see what your opponents are going to do. So it has this feeling of randomness, even though it isn't random at all. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing for the game. Uh, it's also very quick to play. I think uh, I did say that each of the phases took a different amount of time based off of how each of them went. But I think the overall game itself took maybe 40 minutes for all three of the run throughs of the game. And uh, from uh, what I understand, the actual original printing of this game uh, was just about like playing each one of these as individual games even, and um, just playing a whole bunch of them at a time because the experience of playing it is is just such a fascinating thing. So at this point, I have just played the game once. Uh, I do actually have a physical copy of this one in my collection though, and I'm happy to have it. Uh, this is one that I am looking forward to bringing to game nights when those actually happen again in a post-pandemic world, uh, because the game is so quick to teach, and, and it really does foster some very interesting discussions around the table as you're trying to group think this whole thing across, trying to squeeze out just a little bit more benefit for you than other players. Uh, so just like the rest of the games I've talked about tonight, uh, this is one that I am looking forward to trying more in the future because of the situation that it puts you into, because of the super quick rule teach, and because of the very quick amount of time it takes to play before you can try something else. Uh, so yeah, I think I am in full on ramble mode. I should try to wrap this one up. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I played all four of these games in one evening. Uh, I think we played games for about three three hours and played all four of these games, uh, and I had to learn all of them. Although, I guess I technically knew Northern Pacific already. I read the rules to that, and the rules are so simple, it's not like there's that much time to teach it. Uh, so it was a very successful uh, night of Cube Rails style gaming, uh, even though <laughs> there are no cubes in Erie Railroad, and Bites is all about ants, but it definitely had that 
stocked vibe going through a lot of these things. And uh, yeah, it was a good time. And I'm looking forward to playing these more as well as like five or six other uh, Cube Rails games that I know about and that I've read the rules to, but I haven't had a chance to play just yet. So I don't think this is the last Good Games vlog where I'll be talking about trains. I hope I'm not boring too many people with this. It's just my current infatuation and uh, I'm just going to see where this one leads. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.